There are economic and quality of life benefits to being in a river city. There's also an increased risk of flooding. Just ask Cedar Rapids residents and officials after the devastating and historic flood of 2008, when the Cedar River overflowed its banks and swallowed up businesses and homes downtown and in several neighborhoods. Managing how water flows through an urban area like Cedar Rapids is an ongoing challenge, especially as there are more frequent heavy rain events and aging infrastructure can't keep up. In terms of our storm sewer system, throughout the city we have a, connect a connected network of open ditches, closed storm sewer pipe, um, and areas, and eventually the vast majority of those come to the Cedar River, and not very many of them are gated off. So the Cedar River is generally our lowest point. All of that water has to fall by gravity and get to the Cedar River. Um, the problem is that when the river comes up, that water starts to backflow up that, sand, that storm sewer system. So as that storm sewer system fills, we can actually see flooding not just what you can see from the banks of the river, but as it's going through our low areas and filling up that storm sewer and, and flooding out into the streets through the storm sewer system. The city has installed gates on some storm sewers that can be shut during high water events, and they've built new pump stations that can then pump water from the low areas back into the river when those storm sewer gates are closed. You always have that fear, uh, particularly since 08 for Cedar Rapids, that we could flood again, and that's a, a big burden for the community. Cedar Rapids is not only concerned with rainfall and water flow within the city, they have to monitor the entire Cedar River watershed, and they're at the mercy of what happens to the north. A hundred years ago, farm, no farm fields were tiled, so all of that water you know, sat in those low areas of those farm fields as opposed to running off. So as we see more and more of those farm fields being tiled, uh, we see more and more of that water getting, not only just getting to the river, but it's getting there faster. Uh, what's really helpful to us, what we rely on, is a series of gauges that are on the river all the way upstream. So at any point in time, we can monitor the elevation, um, the flow, and how fast the river's coming up, not only in Cedar Rapids, but in all those points upstream, uh, which helps us be able to kind of predict what's going to happen here based on what was predicted in cities upstream from us and what actually happens there. The city participates in several groups that work on initiatives to better manage the watershed. There's a lot of discussion of regional detention basins and larger detention areas to hold that water back, as well as restoration of, of native areas. So if you have a, you know, just a large area that is grass, that water is going to travel across that grass a lot faster than it would if it was native material. So if it was longer native grasses, no mow areas, that more of that water is going to sit there and be absorbed there. Um, and again, that'll delay the time that it takes to get to the river. Now, it's not change that's going to happen today. Um, it's really, you know, steps that we're taking today that will hopefully improve for, for generations to come, that we can keep improving on that. Those efforts not only help with the quantity of water, but the quality of water, too, by filtering out some pollutants before they get to rivers and streams. Building codes have changed, too. Developers used to be able to put buildings or concrete on 100% of their property. Now, codes force them to include detention basins or other measures to hold some of that water on their property and limit water runoff. What we have tried to do to kind of go above and beyond that is to put incentives in place to encourage existing properties to do the same. So, um, encourage existing properties to take up pavement that they don't need and to put a detention basin in, or if they're redoing a parking area, to put permeable pavers in. So, permeable pavers look like pavement, uh, but the water actually infiltrates down through there and it can be stored underneath the pavement. Um, again, so you're reducing the amount of water that's running off and there's also some water quality if you can filter that water as it goes down through the system. We have to protect ourselves, but we also want to make sure that the amenities that we put in are amenities that can benefit the public. So that's one of the strategies we've had. So, you know, mention our amphitheater. Our amphitheater serves as flood protection but it also, 99% of the time, serves as an amenity for our community. The trail systems that we're gonna build, the levees with trails on top of those levees, all these are amenities that are gonna take this infrastructure investment and assure that it's something that the community can really benefit from. The city acquired and cleared more than 1,000 homes in harm's way after the flood of 2008 and created green space for the river to breathe. A nearly $750 million plan is being carried out in the next 10 to 12 years to fully protect Cedar Rapids from future flooding. Funding for Iowa Land and Sky provided by 
the Resource Enhancement and Protection Conservation Education Program. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief.